you traveling this morning? Mm -mm. I'm starting right now. Good morning. That was another unfamiliar one to me. I thought I'd be able to jump along with it, but it just didn't make sense to me. I'm sorry. But I hope you knew it and could sing along with it. Um, hold on, I'm gonna switch CDs real quick so I'll be ready at the close. Um, for, no, I'm doing my devotional. I'm doing my devotional. Yeah. That's. I'll just fix your sausage on the, not to cook, but to have ready to cook. That's fine. That'll be you about 8.30. Yep. So we are continuing our journey through the scriptures, and we are picking up in Daniel chapter 6, verse 1. Now remember yesterday we just finished with uh, Daniel interpreting the writing on the wall for Belshazzar. Um, and that was probably about, hold on, uh, 539 BC. Here it is, 538 BC. Uh, the events, uh, these events took place shortly after Darius the Mede took over Babylon in October. Because remember, Daniel, um, uh, interpreted for Belshazzar the handwriting on the wall and Belshazzar was killed that night and a new ruler takes over in Babylon and sometimes that means big extreme changes in the way people are treated. Um, so we're here with the very familiar story of Daniel in the lion's den beginning in Daniel 6 verse 1 in 538 B.C. 
Darius the Mede decided to divide the kingdom into 120 provinces, and he appointed a prince to rule over each province. The king also chose Daniel and two others as administrators to supervise the princes and to watch out for the king's interest. Daniel soon proved himself more capable than all the other administrators and princes. Because of his great ability, the king made plans to place him over the entire empire. Then the other administrators and princes began searching for some fault in the way Daniel was handling his affairs, but they couldn't find anything to criticize. He was faithful and honest and always responsible. So they concluded, our only chance of finding grounds for accus accusing Daniel will be in connection with the requirements of his religion. So the administrators and princes went to the king and said, Long live King Darius! We administrators, prefects, princes, advisors, and other officials have unanimously agreed that your majesty should make a law that will be strictly enforced. Give orders that for the next 30 days, anyone who prays to anyone, divine or human, except to your majesty, will be thrown to the lions. And let your majesty issue and sign this law so it cannot be changed, a law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be revoked. So King Darius signed the law. But when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, he went home and knelt down as usual in his upstairs room with its windows open toward Jerusalem. He prayed three times a day, just as he had always done, giving thanks to his God. The officials went together to Daniel's house and found him praying and asking for God's help. So they went back to the king and reminded him about his law. Did you not sign a law that for the next 30 days, anyone who prays to anyone, divine or human, except to your majesty, will be thrown to the lions? Yes, the king replied. That decision stands. It is the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be revoked. Then they told the king, that man, Daniel, one of the captives from Judah, is paying no attention to you or your law. He still prays to his God three times a day. Hearing this, the king was very angry with himself for signing the law, and he tried to find a way to save Daniel. He spent the rest of the day looking for a way to get Daniel out of this predicament. In the evening, the men went together to the king and said, Your majesty knows that according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, no law that the king signs can be changed. So at last, the king gave orders for Daniel to be arrested and thrown into the den of lions. The king said to him, May your God, whom you worship continually, rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den. The king sealed the stone with his own royal seal and the seals of his nobles so that no one could rescue Daniel from the lions. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night fasting. He refused his usual entertainment and couldn't sleep at all that night. Very early the next morning, the king hurried out to the lion's den. When he got there, he called out in anguish, Daniel! Servant of the living God, was your God, whom you worship continually, able to rescue you from the lions? Daniel answered, Long live the king. My God sent his angel to shut the lion's mouth so that they would not hurt me, for I have been found innocent in his sight, and I have not wronged you, your majesty. The king was overjoyed and ordered that Daniel be lifted from the den. Not a scratch was found on him because he had trusted in his God. Then the king gave orders to arrest the men who had maliciously accused Daniel. He had them thrown into the lion's den along with their wives and children. The lions leapt on them and tore them apart before they even hit the floor of the den. Then King Darius sent this message to the people of every race and nation and language throughout the world. Peace and prosperity to you. 
I decree that everyone throughout my kingdom should tremble with fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and he will endure forever. His kingdom will never be destroyed and his rule will never end. He rescues and saves his people. He performs miraculous signs and wonders in the heavens and on earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Daniel's prayer for his people, beginning in Daniel 9 verse 1. This is also in 538 BC. It was the first year of the reign of Darius the Mede, the son of Ahasuerus, who became king of the Babylonians. During the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, was studying the writings of the prophets. I learned from the word of the Lord, as recorded by Jeremiah the prophet, that Jerusalem must lie desolate for seventy years. So I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer and fasting. I wore rough sackcloth and sprinkled myself with ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed, O Lord, you are a great and awesome God. You always fulfill your promises of unfailing love to those who love you and keep your commandments. But we have sinned and done wrong. We have rebelled against you and scorned your commands and regulations. We have refused to listen to your servants, the prophets, who spoke your messages to our kings and princes and ancestors and to all the people of the land. Lord, you are in the right. But our faces are covered with shame, just as you see us now. This is true of all of us all, including the people of Judah and Jerusalem and all Israel, scattered near and far. Wherever you have driven us because of our disloyalty to you. O oh Lord, we and our kings, princes, and ancestors are covered with shame because we have sinned against you. But the Lord our God is merciful and forgiving, even though we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the Lord our God, or we have not followed the laws he gave us through his servants, the prophets. All Israel has disobeyed your law and turned away, refusing to listen to your voice. So now the solemn curses and judgments written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out against us because of our sin. You have done exactly what you warned you would do against us and our rulers. Never in all history has there been a disaster like the one that happened in Jerusalem. Every curse written against us in the law of Moses has come true. All the troubles he predicted have taken place. But we have refused to seek mercy from the Lord our God by turning from our sins and recognizing his truth. The Lord has brought against us the disaster he prepared, for we did not obey him. And the Lord our God is just in everything he does. O Lord our God, you brought lasting honor to your name by rescuing your people from Egypt in a great display of power. But we have sinned and are full of wickedness. In view of all your faithful mercies, Lord, please turn your furious anger away from your city of Jerusalem, your holy mountain. All the neighboring nations mock Jerusalem and your people because of our sins and the sins of our ancestors. O oh, our God, hear your servant's prayer. Listen as I plead. For your own sake, Lord, smile again on your desolate sanctuary. O oh, my God, listen to me and hear my request. Open your eyes and see our wretchedness. See how your city lies in ruins. For everyone knows that it is yours. We do not ask because we deserve help, but because you are so merciful. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, listen and act for your own sake. O oh my God, do not delay, for your people and your city bear your name. Gabriel's message about the exile, beginning in Daniel 9, verse 20. I went on praying and confessing my sin and the sins of my people, pleading with the Lord my God for Jerusalem, his holy mountain. As I was praying, Gabriel, whom I had seen in the earlier vision, 
came swiftly to me at the time of the evening sacrifice. He explained to me, Daniel, I have come here to give you insight and understanding. The moment you began praying, a command was given. I am here to tell you what it was, for God loves you very much. Now listen, so you can understand the meaning of your vision. A period of 70 sets of seven has been decreed for your people and your holy city to put down rebellion, to bring it into sin, to atone for guilt, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to confirm the prophetic vision, and to anoint the most holy place. Now listen and understand. Seventy sets of seven plus sixty-two sets of seven will pass from the time the command is given to rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one comes. Jerusalem will be rebuilt with streets and strong defenses, despite the perilous times. After this period of 62 sets of seven, the anointed one will be killed, appearing to have accomplished nothing. And a ruler will arise whose armies will destroy the city and the temple. The end will come with a flood and war, and its miseries are decreed from that time to the very end. He will make a treaty with the people for a period of one set of seven. But after half this time, he will put an end to the sacrifices and offerings. Then as a climax to all his terrible deeds, he will set up a sacrilegious object that causes desecration until the end that has been decreed is poured out on this defiler. Cyrus allows the exiles to return, beginning in 2 Chronicles 36, verse 22. This is still in 538 B.C. In the first year of King Cyrus of Persia, the Lord fulfilled Jeremiah's prophecies by stirring the heart of Cyrus to put this proclamation into writing and to send it throughout his kingdom. This is what King Cyrus of Persia says, The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. He has appointed me to build him a temple at Jerusalem in the land of Judah. All of you who are the Lord's people may return to Israel for this task. May the Lord your God be with you. Ezra 1, beginning in verse 1. In the first year of King Cyrus of Persia, the Lord fulfilled Jeremiah's prophecy by stirring the heart of Cyrus to put this proclamation into writing and to send it throughout his kingdom. This is what King Cyrus of Persia says, The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. He has appointed me to build him a temple at Jerusalem in the land of Judah. All you who are his people may return to Jerusalem in Judah to rebuild the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, who lives in Jerusalem. And may your God be with you. Those who live in any place where Jewish survivors are found should contribute toward their expense by supplying them with silver and gold, supplies for the journey and livestock, as well as a free will offering for the temple of God in Jerusalem. Then God stirred the hearts of the priests and Levites and the leaders of the tribes of Judah and Benjamin to return to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple of the Lord. And all their neighbors assisted by giving them vessels of silver and gold, supplies for the journey, and livestock. They gave them many jo choice gifts in addition to all the free will offerings. King Cyrus himself brought out the valuable items which King Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the Lord's temple in Jerusalem and had placed in the temple of his own gods. Cyrus directed Mithridath, the treasurer of Persia, to count these items and present them to Sheshbazar, the leader of the exiles returning to Judah. These were the items Cyrus donated. 30 gold trays, 1,000 silver trays, 29 silver censers, 30 gold bowls, 
410 silver bowls, and 1,000 other items. In all, 5,400 gold and silver items were turned over to Sheshbazar to take back to Jerusalem when the exiles returned there from Babylon. Descendants of Jehoiachin, beginning in 1 Chronicles 3, verse 17. The sons of Jehoiachin, who were taken prisoner by the Babylonians, were Sheatiel, Malkirim, Padaya, Shenazar, Jekamia, Hoshama, and Nedabiah. The sons of Pedaiah were Zerubbabel and Shimei. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our second hymn this morning, I hope it's a more familiar, it's a little more familiar to me, is I'll Meet You in the Morning. I think that's right. Oh, sorry, just realized what I did. That's not a two, that's an eleven. I'm thinking in tally marks this morning. I will meet you when you at the broad riverside when our sorrow has drifted away. I'll be standing at the portal when the gates open wide at the close of life's long dreary day. I'll meet you in the morning with a how do you do and we'll sit down by the river and with rapture old acquaintance renew You'll know me in the morning By the smile that's where when I meet you And exchange the old cross for a crown. There will be no disappointments, and nobody shall die in the land where life's sun goeth down. I'll meet you in the morning with a how do you do? And we'll sit down by the river And with rapture old acquaintance renew You'll know me in the morning By the smile that I wear When I meet you in the morning in the city that's built for square. All right, it's an unfamiliar song day. Sorry about that. I hope you knew them and were able to enjoy them. 
Good morning, Rhonda. Good morning, Jim and Peggy. Good morning, Patty. Good morning, Shirley. Good morning, Stephanie. Good morning, Mom. I hope everybody enjoys this day, and I'll see you back tomorrow morning at 8.